go through the whole timeline of what do you need to do to create a business and, and where, where are the gaps, where are the things you don't know. Business of Architecture, episode 291. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today, I welcome Scott Valentine to the Business of Architecture show. Scott is the founder of Valet Architects, based in Brisbane, Australia. I brought Scott on the show because of the way that he's doing content marketing in his practice. His practice is a blend of traditional architectural services, and he includes another element that I thought was very interesting that I wanted to discuss and kind of reveal for you all, and that is online content and courses that are focused on a particular niche, and in this case, hospitality. So in this episode, you'll discover how Scott has modeled the strategies of the marketing and branding world in his architecture firm to create a new innovative model of the architectural practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. And with that, let's get on with today's show. Hello, Scott. Welcome to the business of architecture. Hi, Enoch. Um, thanks for having me on your show. Uh, and yeah, it's great to be here. Excellent. Well, I, when I found your website and found what you were up to, I think we exchanged some emails, Scott, and instantly I saw that you had a different angle that you were taking your firm in. I thought this is very interesting. And so I look forward to sharing a bit about your journey, kind of the inside story, because not only are you offering architectural services, and we'll get into what kind of services you're offering, but you also have courses, digital courses and learning components on your website as well. So take us back and tell us just about your career as an architect and then how you made the, the jump into entrepreneurship. Ah, great. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, we, um, well, I, I started uh, probably 15 years ago in architecture. Um, here in Brisbane City, but I've, I've moved around the world quite a lot working on uh, hotels and resorts or um, just different projects around the world. Um, you know, it's quite fun moving around. So, um, you know, I've worked in Singapore, in um, Barbados and the Caribbean uh, and in, uh, you know, in Jakarta and Perth in, on the other side of the country. So what would uh, you say would be, I'm going to interrupt you here, Scott, what would you, what would you say would, would have been your favorite place that you lived in? Barbados. I will, I will definitely have to say Barbados. I love Barbados. <laughs> it's, it changed my life. Um, I have a, a, um, a strong soca music addiction now, um, which you can Google that if you don't know what that is, but, uh, some of the stuff major, major laser puts out, that's, that's probably a best way to describe it. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, I love Barbados and it changed my life. It was uh, my first hotel project I got to work on with Grounds Kent Architects. Um, they're based in Bali in Perth. And so uh, that, was, that was really fun. And uh, it was real eye-opening eye -opening because I was on site. I think I was only 26 years old, 25, 26 when I got there. And um, I was on site and we were, we were building a physical hotel for people like... Um, Simon Cow and, and there was houses there for like Simon Cowell and Andrew Lloyd Webber and people like that. So it was, yeah, it was a really exciting experience. And, and that was definitely where I got my first taste of working in hospitality design, which is where I focus now. And it's interesting you say that literally changed your life. What was it about that experience that changed your life? How so? Um, just being completely involved in a project, um, seeing sort of another a world away from what I was used to. Um, I, th I think when I was working, despite I was working in Singapore before that, uh, in Brisbane, I was working a lot on, uh, sort of, I guess we'll say residential, but, um, sort of B grade residential sort of stuff. Um, and that's where I learned and, and, you know, learn all the basics of, you know, documentation and all those things you need to know. Uh, so yeah, I, th I think seeing it, just seeing a very different world to what I grew up in, to what, of, what I experienced. Um, you know, we were, we were doing projects for multi-billionaires and, um, we were on site and dealing with the problems of going between builders and, and the end user client and the client in between. And it was sort of rapid learning experience. And, and really st the strange thing is you don't realize how much you're learning until you sort of have to think back oh, and, and you try and put a project together and think, you know, many years later I was trying to put a project together in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, for a friend who, who, who wanted to do something there and just thinking back to what I learned there and the networks I built there and I was like, wow, that was actually more valuable than I thought. Um, and all the rum I drank didn't wipe out everything I, I remembered from the place. So that was good too. 
Special bonus. So there was some rum involved in the mix. There was, there was a lot of rum. There was a lot of rum. Um, if you've ever, ever seen the movie by Johnny Depp, um, Rum Diaries, it was just a lot like that. I haven't, but I, I can imagine. I can yeah. imagine, Scott. So tell me how this experience in Barbados informed your journey into entrepreneurship and maybe even inspired it. Well, it, it was just a, one, a, one part along the way. Um, I think... I think when I was, when I was working for the first time in Singapore in 2006, I think that's where I decided, hang on, I'm sure I can do this. And, and you, you know, you're sitting in the, in the seat of the young, I don't even think I was a graduate then, but you know, young architect seat and you're like, yeah, I can do this. And there's a lot of um, excitement. You're watching everyone else do it. And some of the things we were doing at that point were, were kind of strange. Um, which I probably won't go into, but uh, it, I just thought, no, I'm sure I could do this. And so there was always a, um, there was all this drive, drive to open up my own company by about 30. So I opened my own company by 34. So that's, a, that's about, this, you know, that's only a little bit off. Um, but the, the drive sort of probably came uh, to, to actually open, came just from, um, you know, what am I waiting for? It, it came from a point in time, I, I can't know everything. You know, I think earlier on, I thought, oh, I've got to know how to do this, 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 and this. I, I don't know how to do everything. I know how to do a lot of things, but the, the, I, I decided and came to the conclusion that I will never know everything. And there's no point trying to know everything um, because I'll spend another 20 years and, and still not know everything. So jump in. Um, I know a lot uh, and I've worked on a lot of projects and I, I felt comfortable with, with what I knew um, to just take that leap forward and, and take that step forward. Um, and, you know, and, and a few, there was a few sort of tragedies uh, around within my, my friends and that, that are uh, no longer with us. And I thought to myself, well, why, why waste any more time? This is what I want to do. This is all I want to do is, is start up my own company. So I sold everything I owned um, and uh, which I had an apartment in the city and it was probably about it. I just had an apartment and brought my life back down to some very basic things. And we set about just trying to understand how can I set up an architectural firm differently? I'd worked with many architectural firms over 15 years or at that time, 12 or 13 years. And I'd seen the good and the bad. I'd seen things work and not work. And I thought, how can I do this dramatically differently? Because the, what I noticed watching others do it is, um, they would definitely get to about eight to seven years and they'd start kicking a bit, but they wouldn't, it, it, it was very rare for someone to make it big. You know, it's what you see Bianca Ingalls do. That's phenomenal. Like nobody really does that. And so watching somebody go that quickly to where they are now is, is, is kind of amazing. Um, as every architectural student, every other architect probably thinks, but um, most people, don't, they, don't, they don't get really big or it, maybe they don't want to, but, but they still struggle. After 20 years, you'll still hear struggle stories after 20 years. And is that a business? I, I don't know. I, I just wanted to think about how can I do this differently so that over time um, I can get to a point and, and, and it's not like every seven years we're almost going out of business because that's what it's like in architecture, it seems. It's like this everyone sort of starts panicking every seven, about every seven years. Uh, and we've been through a few of those phases in the last 15 years. So um, that was the goal. And, uh, and you learn a few things along the way, things that you had assumptions about that you, you thought you could change, but you can't, and things that you, you have been able to change. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, I'm not sure if I'm still answering your question now, but that's kind of where that started. And, and, um, and it sort of grew from there. We spent, I spent about a year researching, how can I do this? How can I play this game differently? What, what is a brand? I didn't even know what a brand was when I started out. Um, and, and just trying to fill in the blanks of the things I didn't know. I was on the technical side of doing architecture. So project architect kind of role. And so I didn't know the business of architecture and most people I would speak to would tell me a very similar story. Oh, you need to, you know, you need to do a t uh, some renovations and, and then you go up to do a house and then you get some townhouses and then you get into bigger stuff, which is a very typical way to do it. And it's probably actually the easiest way because the way we're doing it is not the easiest way at all. 
But um, yeah, we're just trying to do it. We're pretty much experimenting on on how you start up an, uh, an architectural firm in a, in, a, in a different way, in a very considered way, um, rather than rocking up and saying, hey, look at me, I'm the architect. I'll, I'll, I'll draw something for you. Um, there needs to be a bit more of a story from that because nobody cares if you're the architect. Um, they care about their problems. Um, they care if you can solve their problems. Um, and, you know, just because you're an architect, it, it doesn't mean you're that special. And well, at least they don't perceive that despite the years of work you put in, despite the knowledge you have. Um, yeah, so we, we, need to, we needed to deal with that problem of just being, hey, I'm an architect to, hey, here's my story. If you, if you like my story, if you like what I do, um, come along for the ride. So let's unpack this. You said there were some certain things you were seeing in the practice of architecture that you wanted to innovate on and you wanted to get away from. Let's call these some pain points or some things that you wanted to avoid. One of these you mentioned, Scott, was this seven-year cycle, 10-year cycle, but these dips, this cyclical kind of cycle to architecture thought, if there's a way to get out of that, let's do that. Another thing you talked about is showing up as just the architect. And I want to explore what that means to you. Let's see if we can hash out a list here of what were maybe two or three or four specific things that you saw with the industry and traditional practice that you said, I would like to find a solution to that. See if there's an alternate way of doing that. Yeah. Okay. We'll try and think these through. It's pretty early. So my brain's somewhat functioning, but um, yeah, I, I think definitely one was um, not being valued in the industry, not being valued as an architect. Okay. So let's maybe call that commoditization. Um, you, maybe uh, because it would be, as an architect or an industry, we're not valued, but then we're also then all going and undercutting each other. Um, and it's a, it's a race to the bottom. If you're not making any money, then you, you're not getting anywhere and, and you're living a fantasy life that you're going to get somewhere one day, which I could be living right now for all I know. <laughs> we all probably live that sometimes for sure. It depends on your definition of where you want to get to, right? So we talked about this, right. this conversation of undercutting. Uh, we're talking about this conversation of the cyclical nature. Mm -hmm. What were some other things about the practice of architecture that you didn't like that you saw? Um, well, part of it, uh, I guess, I guess part of it was that there was no different, like, um, you know, how does a client differentiate between you and somebody else? Um, because when you go pitch on a project, everyone would be pitching on the same project. Um, it must be very confusing for them. Uh, so I, I, I don't think there was a lot, a lot greater, a lot of greater meaning in the work people are doing. Um, and, and then I was to find out, you know, you know, that there's the way we do architecture now, we ingest a lot, we integrate a lot more value into it by, by stealing ideas from marketing. And I'll come to that, that later, but I think in, in most cases in my previous time, it was, um, what's the best word? It was, uh, I, I found it was void of, of a lot of, uh, valuable meaning. I think the architecture and I, I, I think maybe I'll talk a bit more in, in a bit about that when I talk about how we do it now. Okay, gotcha. And let's see. So there's this idea of differentiation that you talked about. There was also the idea of the slow ramp up period where architects were coming into their own. And, and I've seen this as well with the many architects that I've uh, interviewed, you know, going from startup to actually being able to have the more influential, the more exciting, the more challenging projects, the bigger commission projects that we wish we could work on. You're right. It is, there can be quite a long time frame there, even for someone who's really diligent and motivated. So would you say that that was another point that you wanted to hopefully shortcut or avoid? Yeah, sorry. That's actually probably one of the biggest. I mean, it was, um, and now that you've sort of pointed out, it, it wasn't so much about starting an architectural firm. It was like, how fast can I do this and get big? How can I get a big name and, and be, create a, a bigger firm? Um, that's really the exciting idea for me. Now, if I don't have a big firm, that's fine. But the challenge of, of trying that is, is kind of where it's at for me. And, um, so, and, and each stage of that challenge is, is a new challenge to, to deal with, but that was, that was kind of it. And that's why we focused a lot on branding and, and building our name, um, above anything else and, and why we put our focus where we put our focus. So that was definitely one of the, the big challenges that I wanted to undertake. Like, okay, so if you wanted to make a really big firm from scratch, how do you do that? Because 
that to me is exciting. That, that to me is remarkable and, and worth testing and, and seeing if I can do it. I don't have family. I don't have um, people relying on me. So I can give it a go. Um, other people out there don't have that luxury. They've, you know, got kids and, and life's mortgages and things like that. So I'll give it a go. Now define big for me, help me understand what do you mean by a big firm? Cause it could be big idea. It could be big team. It could be big projects. Define what, what you mean. I, mean, by I think, big. yeah, I, I think it would be, um, probably big projects and, uh, probably medium sized firm as far as me, amount of people go. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's just, it's, it's big sort of, um, big projects, being able to get big projects. My value is really in designing 50,000 square meter resorts. That's what I know how to do. Um, I can't get those cause I'm quite small, but that's where my value is and where my, my knowledge base is. So, um, you know, that would to be able to, you know, how, how long does it take to get those projects? Usually it would take, you know, 10, 20 years, 30 years, maybe to be able to get those sort of um, big projects. So it's, it's really the challenge of, can I do it? Can I convince people that I can do it for them? I've done it a lot before. So, yeah. Awesome. So what I'm hearing is that the, the big firm would be a, a mid-sized team and you'd be winning these five fifty thousand square foot size kind of projects in the hospitality yeah, niche. 100,000 square foot, yeah. To 100,000, yep, okay. And really basically giving yourself the opportunity to operate within your zone of genius of what you feel like you can do as an architect. And it also sounded like name recognition and a bit of maybe, maybe not celebrity, but a bit of maybe a bit of that, right? A bit of like being a recognized name and a brand that people trust. Yeah. Well, that would be more about being able to get the jobs or being able to get the, the projects. Um, you have to be a recognized name brand and or whatever else, because uh, a lot of the time with big projects, that's the reason somebody comes with you. They just, they want the brand that associated with you. They, well, that's, that's one part of part of it. And um, that's what's, you know, that's, that's what brings things in is, is a brand. Uh, so, um, not celebrity for the state of sake of celebrity. Um, just, just for the sake of marketing for the celebrity for the sake of marketing, I guess is the best way to put that. We'll summarize that down. Okay. So when you started the firm, what was the vision you saw your first plan about how to achieve that in, in an accelerated time frame? Yeah, so um, it took me a little while of researching, understanding, read a lot of Marty Neumeyer's books, recommend those to everyone. He's got two there, Zag and um, The Brand Gap. Um, Enoch, uh, sorry, not yourself, um, Blair Enns. Blair Enns, who you've had him on your show before. Um, he's, he's a great writer, following along with him. And, and quite a few other branding and, and books like that. So I, um, sorry, what was the question again? Is, is how do I do that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious because where I want to go with this is you've been in practice for two years now or about that. Pro probably when you started out, you had a specific idea or vision about, I'm going to try this because I think this is a way to accelerate it. And then I want to compare that with now looking back, obviously that plan has changed. It always does an entrepreneurship, right? If it didn't, that wouldn't be the game of entrepreneurship. So I want to start out first of all with the plan that you saw at that time. And maybe it's the same plan or maybe it's different. We can explore that after. Yeah. So the, the plan was at the start was, okay. And I, and I did a marketing course and then I sat down and I thought, okay, if, if, if marketing goes here and I, I write all this stuff down, so I make it nice and visual because I'm an architect, right? Um, if I'm marketing, what am I marketing? Oh, I, I need a unique value proposition and then I need a, and I need a brand. So I then had to go in, okay, what's my unique value proposition and what's my brand? What, what do I want it to look like? What do I want to what do I want it to feel like and how do I want it to communicate it with people and who do I want to communicate it with? So I was pulling apart all of these different pieces and I would write this down and stick it all over the wall so I could sort of get an idea of a map of, of where I was going and, and create a strategy. Um, and we created a strategy based on content because I think, um, sorry, I don't know his name, but 30 by 40 workshop. He does it quite well. Um, his brand's quite big. Everyone kind of knows who he is. Um, he communicates well with the non-architects out in the world. Um, sorry, if you know his name, I don't, I, I sort of just click on his videos. Um, but creating content to help people, um, help them within the space that we work in, which is hospitality design, and help them understand how we can help them um, through our thinking. And that, that was part of probably the strategy, and it, and it worked really well. Um, we put out a, we put out this, a guide. I, I was going to a lot of meetings and talking with a lot of clients, uh, or potential clients rather, 
Uh, and they would say, we, we want to be top 10 or top nine tiles on Instagram back then. You had a top nine tiles on Instagram. And so I thought, oh, there's something here. There's some content we can create here. You know, why, why is, they were saying that because they wanted, they knew that the, um, they knew that the market was, was looking at Instagram for their travel and for their hospitality. They had to make it big on Instagram so they can make it big in hospitality. So I thought, okay, there's something here. You know, why is this happening? Um, so we just, I applied a lot of the theory that I'd learned in building my own company to um, creating some content around the thinking and the theory behind why Instagram helps a, a physical business um, and how you can use it to uh, attract people to your to your um, to your business and how you should design for that and and we went through and we hypothesized on on photos um, how people uh, take photos on Instagram and and how that helps their experience but the idea was to 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 put some thinking out into the world and help people understand um, some theory behind design, a little bit of theory so that they can implement it in their own business. So this was designed for business people. Now it, it sat for six months. Nobody picked it up. I had 50 downloads and then all, all of a sudden Dazeen got it. It took off. So this, this whole idea of creating content to help the, the world of design and help the world of hospitality, it worked. Um, the zine got it and then it was taken up by Arc Daily uh, we got an interview on uh, BBC. Uh, we were published on in the Guardian. About fifty different articles picked us up um, because we were out there trying to help the world, and we'd picked up on something that was happening in the marketplace probably a year before. I think a lot of people knew this was happening, but we were talking about it. We wrote the book on it, um, designing for Instagram, I guess, and that really resonated with uh, a lot of people. The the, the Guardian article that um, Oliver Wainwright, I got his name right, um, wrote, got uh, I think uh, 200,000 hits in two days or something like that. You know, people were really interested in this idea of Instagram and design. So, so we kind of picked up on something a little bit earlier than the the, um, the traditional media, and they and, it, and they loved it, and 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 from that we. You know, we, you can now find us quite easily online and we got a call from a, a producer in, in Santa Monica asking us to produce a Netflix show. Um, we, what else did we do? Yeah, I, yeah, it was just kind of incredible. And that was by year one. This was in one year we'd achieved this much um, sort of press success. I don't, I don't know what you call it, branding success. Um, so I, I was quite excited about that and it was, it was the strategy. That was the strategy and it worked. And I'm message Blair ends and I'm like, your ideas worked. I, I pretty much just did what Blair said to do. Um, and it worked and we got a big name in, in one year, easy to find. And people message me all the time. Wow. These, this content you make is helping me so much. So that's really cool. Uh, so that was sort of the original sort of strategy that we did. Let's, let's help people. We'll put content out. We'll just follow what Blair ends says cause he's done it. He's smarter than me. And, um, and then people will come to us, which is the idea. Now, as far as projects go, the, the problem we find because architecture is such a big investment, it's, the buildings are very expensive, as, as opposed to graphic design is much less expensive unless you're doing the, they're doing those big projects. But, um, you know, trying to, trying to get that through content marketing is very hard. It's very, very hard. I think my ambitions at the start was, okay, yeah, in a year or so, we'll, we'll get a project. But um, we had a little bit of interest and we pitched on a project in Manila. Um, we did some work with Bolshe Fire from Major Laser. Now that was just because I talked to him on, online. Um, but yeah, the, the content marketing, I'm, I'm not sure who else is doing it like we're doing it or if anyone else is doing it like we're doing it, that when you're dealing with a million, $10 million investments, the price of the property, I think it's, um, I think it's going to take a little bit more than that. And, and we will see, we'll see over time how this content game works. Um, because the idea is I, I want to build trust with the world because as I said before, I moved around a lot through the Caribbean, Asia and Australia. So I don't have a local network. Now, if you have a local network, wherever you are, it should be much easier to, 
to go around and find jobs and projects. I don't because I moved around a lot. And so my only option was go online and build an international network and see what happens. So that's what happened in the first year. Now let's contrast that with you've been two years through the process. How's it going and what is the content thrust of your firm right now? What's the views for the future? What's worked? What hasn't worked? Yeah. So um, we decided to put a little bit more focus on the content and split the brand from Valet Architects to Valet Academy uh, and Valet Architects so that people could have um, a bit of an easier understanding. They were a little bit confused on what we did actually in that first year. Um, so we, we split it up into services. So in Valet Architects, um, we keep it clear. What we do is we have a point of differentiation is in, in what we do is we, we take the marketing aspects. We pretty much stole from um, branding and, and marketing the ideas of creating user personas and ident user, um, user, user centered design, basically in idea, they call it human de centered design. There's a lot of different ways of doing it, but we take that idea. We put it at the start of the uh, architecture process. And so that we're always designing around a, a human being and then the way they, um, act, behave, their mindsets, their wants and needs. So we, we have a specific way of doing that. And so that's Valet Architects. We, we can do that within the hospitality sector. And then in Valet Academy, what we're trying to do is help hospitality entrepreneurs and the designers that serve them. And, and that's so that that's split away. And the whole idea there is, again, just trying to help people grow. It, I found that a lot of designers were downloading our, our content and reading our content, including from the really big um, the really big firms in the world. So that was kind of interesting to see. So I thought, okay, if I can build that audience as well, um, then what we can do is eventually find a way to make money off that. And so the success right now, um, it, the success is having to, to walk around again, come back to Brisbane and get into the local uh, network and community. And uh, the same thing you, any normal architectural firm would have to do. So I'm not, I'm not able to get away from that um, as much as I would have liked to, or it was hoping, I guess. I guess I was, I was hopeful um, content would uh, reel in the projects. Uh, and the experiment, it, it's working, but it's, it's just gonna take longer. It's just gonna take a lot longer than I think I first hoped. Um, but yeah, so so to get those first projects, it, it's still it's still one on one contact as any any other architect would have to do. So I guess the, there's the the end of the, not the end of the experiment, but after one in that two year period, it's like okay, content's great, but it's a long term uh, it's a long term investment. It's a really long term investment, so that people can always find you, they can get help from you, and they can trust you. But to get those projects, it is it is still uh, a one-on-one -on -one contact, knowing somebody kind of thing. Sorry, I'm shivering a bit here. It's cold. <laughs> wow. Okay. So we have, it sounds like you're talking what I'm hearing from you, Scott, is that we have a big game. We have a long-term game. That's the mm -hmm. content game. And you're going to continue to produce content. And that's going to be something that over time will be an asset for the firm. And then you have the shorter term game, which is, Hey, we need to pay the bills right now. Let's get some work and let's build out the local network on the short term game of just getting projects uh, through this face-to-face -face communication, what are you finding? What's working for you in that arena? Um, well, I've only been back a month. <laughs> so um, I'm usually, I'm between here and Bali. So okay. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do, you, what do you do in Bali? So you have a separate house there that you work out of or what's, what's the deal with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just there regularly because in producing content, it's a game of, okay, what do I produce this week? It's going to take me some time. I'll sit down and think through it. And it's cheap to live there. Sure. So, yeah. That's and are you a surfer? I'm not actually. And I don't go in the water there. I don't trust the water there. So I don't go in. Because I, of I pollution? Everyone. Yeah. There's a lot of pollution, unfortunately. A lot. A lot. Yeah. But it's a wonderful place. The people are the nicest people in the world. I love it. So um, it's, it makes it good to just sit there and sort of that's where you can do some writing and, and not be burning money like in Australia, it's very expensive now. And I think, uh, where are you based in America? California. Okay. So yeah, you know, expensive, right? It's super yes. expensive. Everywhere in uh, developed countries is money just falls out of your pocket. So yeah, you've, you've got to try and some, find some way of, of making a dollar lot run further. Sure. And how are you paying the bills right now, Scott? Um, through whatever com comes through the door <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and what's coming through the door right now? So you're bootstrapping. What's coming through the door? Uh, contract work. Contract work is, is what comes through the door. Yeah. So it's, um, we, we played a high risk game and that's okay. I'm good with that. Uh, so there was supposed to be a few projects happening by now, but uh, some incidents have happened. Didn't happen. My, a friend of mine was, was going to, we were going to do like a, a funky laundromat and then he got hit by a car. Uh, he's okay. He's 100% okay. He was fine that day, but he's, it was just like he's, he sort of put the hold on that idea anyway. Uh, so yeah, so some things were happening and those were going to happen within my, my known network as well, not from outsiders um, coming through content. Uh, so, I mean, within this, this, this year, we've been trying to focus more on the content creation and then we, and, and making money through that. So we also, we sell our guides online now. And so we make a little bit of money through that, which keeps us going as well. Yeah, I find this very interesting. I mean, so obviously Business of Architecture is a content platform, right? Mm -hmm. And Valley Academy is a content platform. And I find it very interesting that you've niched down or niched down, however people want to say it, into the hospitality industry. And that's very interesting because it's it's very very, uh, very deep. You've gone deep, but it seems to me like that actually could be a really good niche to be providing content for. Because like you say, there's a lot of designers around the world that work in hospitality. There's probably a great hunger for that kind of information. Yeah. And having worked in it a bit, I just, I look back now and I believe within the whole industry, there's, there could be a lot more in-depth thinking about, you know, what everyone is doing. Um, which is what we provide content on. And we, we try and encourage people to, to think about the end user. Um, and we, we have systems, systems to sort of um, to define what, you know, define who that user is, create user personas. Um, I'm not sure who else is doing this in architecture. It's been around for about 12 years in marketing and, and advertising, but I'm not sure who's doing it in architecture. I know Hassel, I think I'm doing it. Uh, they bought a company called Free State, so I believe they're doing it. But other than that, I don't know who else is doing it. Um, and and we we talk about you know define the user's problem. What problem are you solving for the end user? And we try and focus all our conversations around that end user. So if we go into a meeting and we meet with a client, then we're we're somewhat neutral to the end outcomes because we're trying to solve that end user's problem and then solve that so that it solves their business problem because they want to sell to that end user. So we see architecture very much as um, one part of the um, one part of the equation in solving business problems. Architecture is a solution to a business problem. A website is a solution to a business problem. What is the problem they're having the, the business is having? And then how can we solve that with architecture? Awesome. What's your plan going forward? Like for the next six months to continue forward? Yeah. So, um, my plan is, is literally get out every single day to an event, meet people and say, hello, do the thing that I probably should have done at the very, very start. Um, but now I've got a good story to sell. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's good. And then they can go on. And when I meet people, they can learn something from us and they can instantly. So I, I guess now I'm, I'm well positioned when I meet someone, tell them my story, um, direct them to what we do. And then they can instantly start building a rapport and trust in me through the work that we've done. So th that's, that's basically the plan for the next six months. Um, it, what I find having put that content out is stuff just sort of happens. Weird, weirdly you get a message like, do you want to be the Gordon Ramsay of architecture? Okay, cool. Let's do that. Um, somebody sort of calls me up and asks me to do that. Now that hasn't, that hasn't come to fruition yet. I think it's sitting on the shelf at Netflix as an idea of if they want to design show and, and you know, whatever that happens, it happens. Cool. But, um, yeah, what I find with the content thing is randomly things happen, but you can't rely on the randomness of that because it, it just takes that right person to search it and find it and go, Hey, can we do this project together? So it's, it, it's, it's being proactive about it and having the content out there. I guess what we've done is, is positioned ourselves well to have something that people can grasp and hang on to and, and understand as far as um, what we do and how we can help them. And, um, and now that I, I, I can run around and, and talk to people and find people with problems and, and 
see who gets what we're saying and the language to, to say it to them in. Uh, you find when I, when I talk about what we do and, and how we do it, you can sort of see it in people's eyes. They, they light up if they get it and they look confused if they don't. And so you've got to try to try to change your language on, on how you're speaking and, and it's a challenge every time. So yeah, so my plan for the next six months is just run around, find projects and something will pop up. I'm just, it happens and then make money also off our, um, off our guides. Uh, we've got one little course on there. And we were trying to make some other courses, but we put that on hold for now. We've got a list of courses we will eventually make um, that are probably unique in the space. And some of those are, are using uh, social media data to firstly understand your users. So you can go into a meeting with a client and, and already start talking about the end user and the problems you can solve for them. Um, and, and, a, and a bunch of things like that. So we've got some of those things in the, in the pipe works to happen, but uh, yeah, we need to keep this, ship funded um that's right scott what are the top two or three lessons that you've learned in this journey of entrepreneurship that you can share with either new firm owners or even seasoned firm owners uh, i would definitely question everything myself uh, question your own assumptions um some of them you might get some new outcomes uh but also you'll find some other things which you cannot change. Uh, so that was fun. Um, I would, it's going to take a lot longer <laughs> than you ever thought, but don't believe that because you probably won't do it. So think it's going to take a short amount of time and it won't just have a big bag of money, have a really big bag of money. If you're starting out, it's, it's very helpful or have a, a, you know, some clients that keep giving you work. One problem of, I notice is in the, the, when you start out is you start out, you bid it, you get the, you bid cheap to get the project, you get the project, you need to employ the people. And then all of a sudden you've got these people you need to keep employing and you need to keep getting projects. And you, you start to sort of what I witnessed looking from the outside in now, I wasn't in their shoes. So I can't comment too much on it, but it seems like we, we dig ourselves holes, um, creating those situations where we just go and be the architect and so that's what I was trying. That was another thing I was trying to avoid, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, so th that's, I guess, understand marketing, understand marketing. It's, it's, it's good because if you've got those projects coming in from someone, you know, um, and you haven't understood the marketing side of things, then you will, um, I think, you could run into a hole in the, in the future. And that's just, I guess, another thing we're trying to avoid um, when we get up and running that, that in a, in a sort of consistent way that we understand the marketing, we understand the processes from start to finish. And I guess, I guess that's another thing to understand is draw out physically because you're an architect, you know, um, drawing, you really get that. It, it really resonates in your head, but go through the whole timeline of what do you need to do to create a business and, and where, where are the gaps? Where are the things you don't know? Do you need to learn something or do you need to bring someone else in to, to fill those gaps? And yeah, just try and timeline it down, out like you would when you project manage a project or something like that. That's, that was a big help for me. Just, just sort of visually seeing everything and, and finding, trying to find the holes in what I don't know. And um, yeah, you probably don't need to go to university for all this stuff. You can learn it all pretty much online through your channel, a few other channels and about $500 worth of books. It just takes time to learn it all. Yeah, I think at the moment that's it. I don't know. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks. Thanks, Scott, for exposing us to what you're doing. I'm glad we got to tell my audience about you and your firm. Look forward to having them check you out and really following along this journey. Uh, I think that you're part of this new age of architects that are coming to the table with the idea of content marketing, with the, the idea of the information age. And this is going to be very interesting to see where this goes. Oh, thanks. Thank, thanks, Ina. I really appreciate you having me on here. Sorry, I'm sort of shivering a little bit, a bit cold here, but um, we got through it. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. 
The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.